Wednesday, May 4th, requesting mm -hmm. items. It has all the items listed, and we'll let you read them <coughs> that uh, we can <coughs> bring for that. And it says the Welcome Center, but they moved them to the main auditorium. I don't know if they're going to move them back and forth like that, but for the next service, but they're in the, uh, they were in the auditorium when we left Sunday. Ladies' uh, class luncheon next week, May 10th. It says, see Marsha for information. I can tell you we have a list back there uh, right where the song books are for you to put your name and what you plan to bring. Because it's, we don't have a real large group and we want to kind of know what we're going to have and not have the uh, five plates, I mean, the bowls of something. Johnny? Um, I'd like to add to the prayer list. Okay. My great, uh, well, David's my great niece is in the hospital, okay. and they're not really sure what all's going on with her. And she's been having issues for quite a while now, and we're hoping they can find something out. She lives in the San Antonio area. Okay, how old? I mean, she's, six, she's 16, and her name is Jaylee. Jaylee. Okay, and her name is yeah. Jaylee. Jaylee. Oh, I thought you said Jaylee. I'm going to ask Jaylee. You. J a y l e e. Okay. <coughs> okay. We'll remember her. Um, <coughs> back to the luncheon thing. I'll be sure that if you think of what today, while you're if you haven't signed up and don't know what you're going to bring, see if you can think about it and and put it down so that will help us to know what foods we're going to have coming in. <coughs> um, ladies quilting is going to be uh, Tuesday, May 17th. That's after we close out our class for the for this session. But we're going to meet at 10 a.m. Uh, till noon. And don't forget to bring a sack lunch, it says. Um, our uh, prayer this morning is going to be said by Donna, and the songs, of course, is going to, are going to be led by Jean. Is there anything else that someone has wants to tell us? Or? Um, yeah, uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I'm sure you announced it about Jackie. Uh, I don't know. I, I talked to her last night after she was at the doctor's, mm -hmm. and the cancer mass is all around her kidney. Are you talking about Jackie or Jamie? Jackie, brother. Okay. Bill is his sister. Didn't know she had oh, I, I didn't know that. No, I know. She didn't know until yesterday. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so, um, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. So, um, okay, we, we need to pray for her. But, um, she doesn't know just what to do. We're going to do surgery. It's on the kidney, so at least she said they'll take out the kidney since there's two and uh, but it um, sounds really really bad she and her daughter were going uh, her daughter was with her yesterday yeah but did she just find this information out yeah, yesterday afternoon oh yeah and with what she has coming up now thank you for telling us that okay. we need to pray for her okay okay uh, Anybody else? Well, that's how, that's what um, Janie had, but they yeah. took out one of her kidneys. So yeah. That's, what it that's why I was a little confused, you know, first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Janie, I mean, excuse me. I'm just rattled this morning for some reason. Uh, Jane, we want to lead our song now. <coughs> And then Donna will come and lead our prayer. Number four sixty two. Four six two. For broad faith that will not shrink. Six to we will do all four. 
verses. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving, knowing that all blessings come from you. We thank you for our very lives, for our families, homes, food, clothing, friends, and even more valuable are our spiritual blessings. We praise and give our thanks for forgiveness, love, mercy, grace, salvation, and the knowledge we have of our Creator and the hope we have through our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we never take for granted all our blessings and be thereby motivated to show and teach others about you. Give us the courage to share the wonderful gospel with others. We ask your blessings on Bridgewood that we may succeed in reaching out. Be with our elders, minister, teachers, and all who love and serve you. You know our individual weaknesses and needs. We pray especially at this time for our dear sister Jamie, for the therapies that she's undergoing and we pray that you will grant her healing. And even in times that are discouraging, we pray that she will have a faith to keep her strong. And we pray for Jackie, pray for comfort in her loss of her son, and now in dealing with this diagnosis, may she be strong and lean on you to get her through this. And we do pray for healing. And we pray for our dear Betty Jones, for the problems she's having at this time, and pray that her family can um, 
take care of her and that she can get through this this issue. We pray for all of those that are on our prayer list, for those who need your healing, those who need your strength in the loss of loved ones, for those who need your strength with uh, emotional health and relationships. We are so thankful that we have the knowledge that you are always there for us and that we can turn to you. We pray for your church worldwide and especially for those who are experiencing fear and upheaval, such as those in Ukraine. We thank you for the freedoms that we have in our country and pray for those who are in positions of power to rule according to your will. We pray that you will be with us through our study that we might glean from your word something new or a reminder of what we have in you. We ask for forgiveness and your continued blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews, and if we finish it today, next week we will do kind of a review, and I'd like to hear from you things that you have gleaned from uh, the book as we've been studying. Um, I may be still referring to this little handout from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Hebrews 13 shows how to recalibrate life. I think I mentioned to you that uh, I believe it was Tyler King who wrote this and had it out on the uh, Bear Valley Daily Bread uh, uh, email. And as I was thinking about so many of the things uh, that were in our announcement and in Donna's prayer and all, uh, I was uh, thinking about some of these that we discussed a, a bit uh, last time. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, in verse 5, uh, as he, uh, as uh, uh, Tyler King just puts it like this, don't let money gauge happiness. And that's uh, uh, what the writer says basically in verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such as you have. And note too at the end of verse 5, and I uh, I think I've mentioned this previously, but I heard um, earlier, I thought of his name just when I said I heard of this recently, or I may have said this, and then his name just left. Norman Gibson, that's it. <laughs> it came back in. <laughs> yeah, it left, but this way, it left. And he, uh, uh, he taught at uh, Bear Valley for a good while, I think for a long, long time. And it uh, spoke at several lectureships and workshops and things like that. And I, I think he, he taught the Greek there. And he had said about uh, verse 5, the last part of verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That basically in the Greek there are six knots. And he said, we might could read it like this, I will not, 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 not leave you down and out. And I, I just put a note in my Bible here, six months, that uh, God is not going to desert us. God is not going to leave us. God is not going to leave us. And I, I think that's one thing that gives uh, 
I know uh, Janie had, when she was first diagnosed with the uh, cancer, uh, said it's in God's hands, uh, you know, and uh, and that's what gives us uh, the strength and the faith to continue is knowing that he will not leave us. Uh, as David said in the 21st Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, uh, for you are with me. And that is, is so good, and I'm thinking about Jackie facing all of this at, at one time. Sometimes you, uh, it seems like uh, when uh, difficulties come, they, they come in, in groups sometimes. I'm sorry to say in threes, I don't know if that yeah, means it. Moving to the new apartment. apartment yeah, and then has this, yeah. Yeah, and so many things, and, and I know many of you have been through some really difficult uh, things, and I'm thinking about you, too. I, uh, uh, Gary and I pray about you and think about you uh, and the things that you've been through, and I, I think it, it's just amazing that she's still around. <laughs> you know, the stresses that you've had to, to deal with, but how did you get through them? How do we get through those things? Knowing that God will not leave us. He will not leave us in all of this. And sometimes we may feel like we're alone, but God is still there. God is there. And so as he says, the Lord is my help, helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. <clears throat> but we discussed uh, many of those things uh, last time and we looked at verses 7 and 17 together uh, and uh, one thing that uh, uh, Tyler King has here uh, on his for verse 6 put your confidence in God uh, not what you can do but rather what he can do and let him shape you and then for verse 7, be thankful for your spiritual teachers. Anyone who is willing and able to teach you how to get closer to God is extremely profitable. And when the world changes, but Jesus doesn't change. Uh, and I've thought about this a, a whole lot in some of the uh, things that, you know, the, the definition of love out here, it has changed, you know, and, and people will put out on Facebook, Things like, remember that Jesus said, or that Paul said, the greatest of these is love. That's true. That's true. The greatest of these is love. And yes, love suffers long and is kind. And love doesn't envy. And also uh, in Proverbs uh, 10, verse 12, love does cover sin. Love doesn't talk it out here uh, a whole lot. But... If you go on in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love doesn't rejoice in sin and iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And so we, we see people out here trying to use love as saying, uh, you don't love me if you're, unless you agree with my lifestyle or unless you agree with my choices. Well, no, we can't. We can't. Uh, and um, that's important for us to remember, and also perhaps in a loving way, and sometimes it's hard to find that loving way to help people see, because they can't repent unless they know they're in sin. They can't repent unless they know they're in sin. Um, and then uh, today I was hoping to uh, uh, go on into verse 10, and we'll do that in just a minute, but as I was studying Sunday night, and uh, while everybody was doing the stapling and everything, I was sitting back here at the table studying because I, I had a class to, uh, on uh, Monday, and I was having to make out a final exam that I hope everybody can pass <laughs> without making it a Mickey Mouse type final exam. Uh, because the class is so small, I've gotten to know the students better, and I really want them to do well. But, you know, they do have to put out some effort, too. Um, but as I was reading through this again and listening to the whole book of Hebrews, 
this this morning as I was uh, exercising. Uh, in uh, verse 9, uh, the last part of that verse, for it is good that the heart be established by grace and not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. And of course, we, we mentioned there that he's talking about uh, the Jewish uh, feast days and what you could eat and not eat and so on like that. But in Romans 14, verse 17, uh, he, and let's just turn and read that because I think that's uh, important for us. Romans 14, verse 17, what is that? 14 comes after. Okay, what did I say? 14 verse what? 17. 17. Okay. All right. For the kingdom, he says, uh, let's just start with verse 16. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we, we uh, made some application uh, last time to... Uh, how we dress. As long as we're dressed modestly, the kingdom of God is not about clothes. It's not about clothes. Clothing is cultural. Uh, and the kingdom of God is not about clothes. It's not about uh, whether or not women wear makeup. You know, there were some uh, years ago, and as uh, some of the older brethren said, uh, too, that even an old barn looks better with a little paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, we, we sometimes it is so easy to pick out the, the, the visible things, that, you know, instead of looking at the heart, instead of looking at the heart. But the kingdom of God is truly righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to see uh, a little bit later. But here, Paul was saying, or the writer of Hebrews is saying here, that uh, let, let your heart be established by grace and not by foods, which didn't profit those who got so excited about them anyway. Uh, and that's an important thing for us to remember, is what is the kingdom of God? What are the things that are most important in the kingdom of God? Um, then he goes on to say here, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of it, and this was kind of hard for me, I, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read down through about verse 14, I guess. Uh, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Notice how many therefores there are there. Yeah. Let's see, were there three? Three therefores that just kind of follow each other. And, and when I was studying this, you know, uh, sometimes a commentary can get you confused. And I had an older commentary that I was reading through. And I thought, I'm more confused now than I was. <laughs> and so I looked back at all of this because he he's He's looking at two things, at two things here. First of all, in verse 10, he says, we have an altar from which those who serve at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Uh, that's how God provided for the uh, priests in the tabernacle, was some of the offerings that were brought in, they could eat part of it. And so that's how God prepared. And it, do you remember in, uh, it's in 1 Corinthians somewhere, uh, where he talks about the table of the Lord and the table of idols. The table of the, and you can't eat at the table of the Lord and the table of idols. 
well, let's use that same concept and you can't eat at the table of the Lord and the table of the Old Testament sacrifices. You know, and so he says, we have an altar. We have an altar which those that are hanging on to that old covenant and are still worshiping in that way, uh, they don't have a right to eat. You've got to give up. You've got to give up that. And that's why we see through the book of Hebrews is that we have a new covenant. Give up the old one because it it wasn't made to last. It wasn't made to last. And uh, so we have an altar. And I was reading this too, and there are about 14 different. Uh, um, what does the altar, you know, what does that mean? What does it stand for? And there are several different some would say the altar stands for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And some say that the altar just stands for the deity of Christ. And some say that the altar stands Does it matter? Uh, I believe the altar does stand for, or, you know, he's using that concept. What was placed upon the altar? Wasn't it the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I believe he's just using that. Old Testament imagery to get to the fact that we have um, Christ sacrifice for us. We have so our sacrifice. They don't have the right to eat from them. And also, it may make you think, well, what are we eating it? What did Jesus say in John six? I think it was about eating. You know, he said, "I am the bread of life." And then he says later, because it was a hard saying, his, some of his disciples said, this is a hard saying, but as he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And they were like, oh, ooh. But what, what was he, did, did he mean we really need to drink? No, it wasn't. No. And, and some say, well, he was just referring there to the Lord's Supper. I think he's referring to a whole lot more. A whole lot more, you know. Uh, don't we say sometimes that, uh, well, they're just eating up with this or that. Yeah. Unless we ingest the word of Jesus, unless we work in our lives and let him work in our lives and are humble enough to let him become, you know, where we are his hands and feet and we are his mouth. Uh, unless we have him living in us and with us, and then we don't have life. Now that's what I see. Some of the rest of you are looking like you may see something more or want to say something. So say it. I don't throw darts at people. I'm pretty sure he was avoiding cannibalism. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and um, this friend that I'm studying or visiting with, we're, we're studying a little along, Lenore, that I told you about. Um, she was talking about, uh, and she brought this up, and I, I wasn't, I didn't follow through on it because I was trying to lay a foundation uh, somewhere else and not just jump on everything that she said. But she, she said, you know, in the Lord's Supper, you know, that Jesus said of the bread, this is my body, and of the cup, this is my blood. She said, now, when you interpret that, it comes down to theology. Like the Roman Catholics say that that bread actually becomes Christ's body, and the cup actually becomes his blood. And she said, you know, then some people say it symbolizes his, uh, but she said he didn't use the word symbolizes. He just said this is, you know. And um, there's where there is that, uh, but don't we use uh, figures of speech like that sometimes? Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to answer her or to talk with her without getting down in the weeds so much that, you know, nothing is accomplished. But uh, 
uh, she is right in the sense that that yes, there's a division over how you interpret that statement, uh, what Jesus actually meant by that statement. But I think he meant uh, very similar to what he meant with eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, the idea, what does that remind us of when we take the Lord's Supper? Yeah. It reminds us of his suffering, doesn't it? It reminds us also of our sin and our need uh, for him. And so it should bring us closer to him and closer to becoming like him. Uh, and I may be getting in the weeds more than I want to right now. Um, and if you have more to say on that, uh, whatever. Uh, but this is the altar to which we have come, that sacrifice. Now, the other thing that was bothering me, um, let's see, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, 18, yeah. That was what I had looked at, the table of the Lord and the table of idols. That's what I had the note down here. I didn't realize that I did. All right, you can't eat at the table of the Lord and, you know, You've got basically a reality versus a shadow here. Uh, and, um, okay. Yeah, then verse 11. Verse 11 shifts to another idea. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. And uh, I had written down uh, Leviticus 6, verse 30. And so I'm going to go back over there to Leviticus. I had Leviticus 6, verse 30 written down. But no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. But if you go on and read... Uh, let's see, where were we? Where, where was I? Go on and read the, uh, the sin offering in verse, in chapter 4. And uh, Leviticus is a, a bloody book, especially the first part of it. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And this was to teach them, and it teaches us. And in chapter 4, he says, if a person sins unintentionally against the, any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done and does any of them, uh, then he, uh, and I'm just reading some of the highlights here, he, sh he shall take a young bull without blemish as a sin offering, and he shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it into the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. I found that interesting when I read that again. The altar of incense that was right there in uh, the uh, holy place, but very, very close to the curtain there. And the incense went up to God as a sweet savor. And I think it's in Revelation 8 where a prayer is likened to incense. And notice, I, I just, I, I underlined that a little bit more. Uh, if you'll put them on the horns or the parts of the uh, altar of sweet incense before the Lord. He'll put some of the blood there. So the blood, the prayers are going up through or with the blood. And what did John say in First John? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. And I just thought, there's just so much here sometimes that I've I need to write another book. No, I'm not going to. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, 
So anyway, he, he puts the altar of sweet incense, or the blood on the altar of sweet incense, which is is in the tabernacle of meeting, meeting, and he shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And then it tells what he's to do with the insides of it. And uh, that's kind of, I always wondered about that. Uh, I might have figured that out sometime. But it says that in verse 8, you shall take from it all the fat of the bull as the sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat which is on the entrails, and uh, the two kidneys, and the fat that's on them uh, by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys. He shall remove. Did uh, did the Moses and the Israelites know a whole lot about uh, the inside parts of animals? You? Okay. And uh, as it is taken from the bull of the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering, but the bull's hide, here's what I was getting to, the bull's hide and all its flesh with its head and its legs, its entrails, and awful, the whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out it shall be burned and then he goes on to say the whole uh, congregation sins but uh, that that is Kind of more detail about uh, chapter 6 verse 30 no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of meeting to make an atonement in the holy place shall uh, be eaten it shall be burned with fire um, and that's what he's talking about here and outside the camp uh, when the Israelites were uh, moving you know when they were in the wilderness the tabernacle was in the middle, and the uh, tribes were camped in a certain order around it. And so that had to be taken all the way outside, not just outside the tabernacle, but all the way outside the camp, and burned. And then notice what he said, that's the shadow. And he says, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate, outside the city of Jerusalem. And because of that suffering, because of what Jesus did, look at verse 13, therefore, so we've got a therefore based on a therefore. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. We are not a part of the old covenant so we are and there is reproach that we bear as priests are doing do we bear reproach as christians well philippians 3 i, I wrote down a bunch of these and then i got tired of writing them down i thought <laughs> didn't know if i wanted to but philippians 3 10 Philippians 3.10, and y'all are probably familiar with this once I get here, uh, where Paul says he wants to know Christ uh, and he wants to be found in him, verse 9. And then verse 10, and that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh, I like that, don't you? And the fellowship of ooh, his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's where we are. That's a participation with him in suffering. Um, humility is part of that, putting yourself aside. Uh, and I think, I think it was John that mentioned that something that C.S. Lewis had said about humility. Uh, and I, I had read that also, uh, that Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself. It's just not thinking of yourself. 
And um, that's what we are asked to do, not thinking of ourselves. And then, of course, we studied uh, 1 Peter, but it doesn't hurt to go back and see what Peter said about uh, suffering. In 1 Peter 2 and verse uh, 21 here, for to this you were called, okay? Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Well, you know, uh, when I was growing up, a lot of times I would hear that quoted, that just that part that Jesus left us an example that we should follow in his steps. And I thought, I'm okay with that until I read the whole thing. Oh, he suffered, leaving us an example. <laughs> and then I didn't like it as well because his suffering, his suffering, he left us an example. And, um, and look at verse 23 there. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And then it goes on to say, he bore our sins in his own body. If anyone suffered unjustly, it was Jesus, because he bore our sins, not his own. And then in 1 Peter 4, verses 1 and 2, Peter goes on to say, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For as he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So, since Christ suffered for us, not only do we suffer, but also arm ourselves because we are in a warfare aren't we we are in a warfare now uh, max Lucado wants us to think that we're on a uh, cruise ship and he says uh, get to know all of the passengers fish a little uh get to know the captain and get off when you get home i don't read about a cruise ship in the scripture when it's talking to us about who we are but I do read, you know, take up the whole armor of God. I do read that we are in a fight not against flesh and blood. I, I do read those things. And that doesn't mean that we are mean and uh, all like that. We don't fight that kind of battle. And in fact, I'm, uh, I'm rereading uh, the book, Ben Hur. I may have told y'all this last week. I decided I'd just reread the book. I read it when I was a teenager. And then I saw the movie. I've seen the movie so many times, and I still like the movie. But the book is a little different from the movie. I, and I had to get that out of my mind for a while. But uh, it's interesting to see that uh, Judah Ben Hur, after he's been released by the Romans, he's very wealthy now. He's very wealthy. That, uh, he and some of his Jewish friends are so excited to know that the Messiah has been born. And they're so excited about it and that he'll restore the kingdom. So uh, Judah says, okay, all of my money is going to go into to that kingdom. We can fight Rome. We can get rid of them. Everything will be. And uh, Yet there's one person that keeps saying it's a kingdom of souls, a kingdom of souls. And, and, and the rest of the book is kind of, he has to come to grips with that idea that it's a spiritual kingdom. And, and it's just interesting to, to read uh, that. And in the movie, you see a little bit of that. You see a little bit of that, but not as much as in the book. And I just got to that, but I still haven't gotten to the, to the chariot race. <laughs> I've gotten uh, to that, but uh, that's how how Lou Wallace planned the book. He he wanted to show evidence for Jesus through the um, through the conflict that an individual, a Jew, would have in 
coming to the conclusion that this this is a spiritual kingdom and that Jesus really is the Christ and not you know a military leader so that was the the basis on which he uh, wrote the book uh, but it, it's just it was just kind of long. I'm just halfway through it uh, and I've got final exams to do. <laughs> but sometimes you do something that you want to do, right? Um, okay, now let's go to, because I wanted to end on this. Hey, we've got five minutes, and we were delayed a little bit. I wanted to end on this, and then we'll uh, go into the rest of it next time. But therefore, in verse 15, another therefore, Oh, yeah, verse 14, I forgot about it. We have no continuing city here, but we seek the one to come. Isn't that what we learned about those faithful people over in chapter 11? They were looking for the city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Now, I like my little house. It was just a little house. And, yeah. Uh, Julie and Ashley are building a house. I mean, her first little house that she gets. And, you know, and I'm pretty sure you like your own house. And uh, Bonnie's back there saying, yeah, I sure do like where I am. <laughs> Somebody comes in and cleans it. Uh, yeah. But, but that's, not, that's not where we you know, that e even though we can enjoy that, but here we have no continuing city, no continuing house. Uh, we have that home uh, that Jesus went to prepare for us. And in going to prepare that for us, he said, where I am, there you may be also. Uh, we have a little bit clearer vision of that city than those in chapter 11 did. But uh, we sometimes can get real married to this earthly house, can't we? And as Paul said, if the, and he was talking about his body, if the earthly house of our tabernacle is destroyed, what do we know? We have a building of God. Uh, so, uh, and I know that's one thing that gives all of us, uh, all of us comfort and all of us hope. And so we have talked about that uh, a whole lot in uh, chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, and also in verse uh, 10. But verse 15, that's where I wanted to end, because it's a good place to end. Therefore, that's the third therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks in his name. The fruit of our lips and the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of praise to God and the fruit of our lips. What do we, um, what, did I try? what is the fruit of our lips and the sacrifice of praise? Well, one thing that I think of it, and the, the reason that uh, Ruby is leaving is that she has somebody, she had to get a ride to church and back. She messed up the bumper on her car and it's in the shop. So <laughs> it wasn't that I offended her. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, on the sacrifice of praise, many uh, have put that together with, with singing. And isn't that a sacrifice of praise? Don't we praise God when we sing? And of course, Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.17, we make melody in our hearts to the Lord. We teach one another when we are singing. Um, but uh, also in Philippians 4, Paul says to do what? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So the joy we have in Christ that we, can be overflowing. Now that doesn't mean that, 
you know, when we're we're having real trials and struggles that we just go around, yeah, this is everything's say okay, you know. But we there's a difference between the joy that the scripture talks about and the joy out here in this world. And the joy that we have is is something that people can't take away from us. And it's an abiding hope that we have uh, in Christ and knowing that everything will be okay. Now, I was just wanting to uh, mention one or two things here on uh, uh, Colossians and Ephesians, since it, it says also teaching and admonishing one another. I have had friends that tried to split up the church based on the fact that if you sang a song at home or in your car, you were not teaching or admonishing, and therefore you were sinning. And Jean Simpson's smiling because she knows what of them. <laughs> and so that means my grandmother, who when she was sweeping the floor and singing hymns, was sinning. James 5.13 says, If anyone is happy, let him do what? Sing. They say, let him sing, but only when there's a whole bunch of people. No. Let him sing. And my mom, when she was uh, working in a sewing factory and having to do, you know, she's basically doing the same thing over and over and over. She sang hymns in her mind, or low as she, because she, you know, the sound of the sewing machine. And she said that's why it kept her sanity there. And I used to listen to, and still do, listen to recordings of him. So I'm not the best singer in the world, so I listen to somebody else who is a good one. And, and this person was saying that was wrong, too. If I have a tape in my car, and I know Norma Jones used to, uh, she said her grandchildren thought that that uh, that was the only thing they could play in the car, you know. Uh, but if I listen to someone else singing, am I being encouraged and taught? Am I being helped? Uh, but you see, we can, we can split so many hairs, we get ridiculous at this time. And we need to learn to just accept what Jesus said. Just accept what Paul said and accept what the writer says here. Let us, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Singing, but also when we talk to others, uh, telling our blessings. I, I, I have a friend who says that every time someone says, hello, how are you today? She said, I'm just blessed as can be. You know, isn't that good? Because she, she's telling, she's praising God with it. Uh, and sometimes we need to uh, be more aware of what our speech can do in praising Him. And so I'm going to end right there because I've asked Jean to lead a song about praising Him. I don't know which one I said that you can lead praise Him, praise Him, or anything similar. So. Sometimes she comes up with something similar. <laughs> Not this time. Okay. Number 532. 532. Sing, oh, 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 oh,